Greetings, everyone. We are in the month of September, and our topic for Sunday School this morning is Faith Calls for Perseverance. Lesson 1, September the 4th. Dear Father, help us to walk faithfully before you. Help us to hold to your unchanging hand, despite the situations we may face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, let the words that we're about to study, O oh God, be planted in our hearts. Help us to hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you and help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Amen. Reverse Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised and as we always say we will get into our memory verse as we develop our lesson praise the lord for his faithfulness towards us our introduction the ark of the covenant represents represented god's presence with the people of israel it was placed in the Holy of Holies, behind the veil in the tabernacle. The high priest Aaron and the, Levi Le mm, and the Leviticus tribe, the tribe of Levi, was the only ones that could enter in God's presence to make atonement for himself and the sins of the people. Praise the name of the Lord. Aren't you glad we're living in the day and time that God has blessed us to live in? We can enter into God's presence anytime. Let's look at these two little illustrations here. The one here, hopefully you can see my pointer. This was the tabernacle that was built. Uh, God instructed Moses to build the tabernacle. And we see right here the Holy of Holies. Right in the back, it was behind the veil that was here. And my God, only Aaron and the high priest could go back into this section of the tabernacle and be in the presence of God. It's where the Ark of the Covenant dwelled. And only the priest, and then he could only go once a year to make atonement for the people and their sins. So we thank God that, praise God, the day and time we're living in, we can go boldly into the throne of grace. And many of you that are new to Sunday school, this is the Ark of the Covenant. And it was, it was carried by the, the Levites by these gold poles that God instructed them to put on each end. And the presence of the Lord dwelt with the Ark of the Covenant. We thank God for the time that we're living in now, and we'll get into that as we develop our lesson. Sacrifice our high priest, for it is not possible. This is Hebrew, the 10th chapter in the fourth verse. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Animals were imperfect sacrifices that could neither purify nor atone for the sins of the people and in that 12th verse it says but this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of god and we know that man was jesus christ we know that he was that perfect sacrifice and he only had to offer himself one time. Why? Because he lived a sinless not life. There was no sin found in Jesus. He was perfect. And as we said in our previous lesson, well, in our previous verse, it's impossible. It was impossible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away the sins of the people. God had them do this for a reason. Animals were imperfect sacrifices that could neither purify nor atone. It didn't take away the sins of the people. That's why they had to go often and 
bring different types of animals to atone for the sins that they had committed to the high priest or to the priest. But praise God, we can go directly to our Father and be in the presence of our God. So that the Old Testament was written as a shadow of things to come. The Old Testament yet pointed to Jesus, the perfect sacrifice. The veil in the temple separated the holy place from the most holy place. No one could go back there but the high priest. Here we find in our little illustration here, the sacrifice that the uh, priests, the Levites, they killed the lamb. And we see the blood that had to be shed for the remission of the people's sins. We know that the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there will be no remission for sins, no forgiveness for sins. But then we see Aaron here, or one of the high priests, going back into the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, in the presence of God. And he had to make a sacrifice and atonement for himself first, and then for the people once a year. And now we move up to our New Testament. Praise the name of the Lord. We know that Jesus was our sacrificial lamb. He gave his life on this cross. The sacrifice of love. He loved us so much. He gave his life for us. Jesus Christ and the cross. And then we find this. It says, let us therefore come boldly. That veil in the temple was rent in half. And the people no longer had to go to the priests to offer up atonement for their sins or an animal sacrifice for their sins. He said, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Jesus made it possible for us to go boldly to God, boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in the times of need. He paid the price. He gave his life. He shed his blood that we might be able to go boldly to the Father and pray. Praise the name of the Lord. Going to our first outline, description of the priesthood of Christ. Description of the priesthood of Christ. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and we're starting with the 19th verse through the 21st verse. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Saints, we can go into the holiest of holy because of the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil. And what was the veil? That is to say, his flesh. He gave himself. He came in the flesh, died on the cross. And was risen again and seated on the right hand of the Father. And having a high priest. Saints, we have a high priest over the house of God. A once and for all sacrifice. A holy sacrifice. He is our high priest. Jesus Christ. Priest is superior. Jesus, our high priest, is superior over all. Man no longer had to go to a man, the Leviticus priesthood, to offer up atonement for their sins. Now we can go boldly to our high priest, thank you, Jesus, and he's superior over all. He is the only way, the truth, and the light. No man can come to the Father except by him. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. He is our sacrificial lamb that takes away the sins of the world. My God, he not only died uh, for my sins, he died for your sins. He died for the sins of the whole wide world. He is our mediator between God and man. He changed our relationship between God and man. He brought us back with the price of his blood. His shed blood. He is our sacrificial lamb. Praise the name of the Lord. Brings us to our second outline. The priesthood of Christ. 
and our profession of faith. Hebrew 10, 22 through 25, the entrance into the presence of God. Let us draw nigh or near with the true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The priest had to wash himself, but on put on priestly apparel before ministering in the presence of the Lord. But we saints today, my God, we can go boldly to the throne of grace with a true heart, with a clean heart. And we know how to get our heart clean with full assurance of faith. Why? Because we have faith in what Jesus has done for us. And he sprinkles our heart from an evil conscience. When we go before the throne of grace, there's no sin in our life. We have confessed our sins and we find forgiveness in him. And our bodies are washed with pure water. Amen. Uh, we, can, we are washed through the blood of the lamb. We're washed through the word of God. We are washed and, and it can also symbolize baptism. We buried with him when we go down in the water and when we come up, we are alive into a brand new life. We no longer have to wash a physical washing like the priest. The priest had to wash himself, put on priestly apparel before ministering in the presence of God. We had a, a, one of the older saints in our church, in the, my former church, used to tell us, you don't just come before God any kind of way. And she didn't, didn't mean so much as the way you were dressed or what you had on. But she meant in your heart. You don't go before God with sin in your heart. The first thing you want to do is ask God to forgive you for everything you've ever done wrong. And if you don't know any better and you go before God and you start talking with him, if you will allow him, he will talk back to you. And he will let you know to confess your sins and that I'm faithful and that I'm just. And that I'll forgive you from all your sins. I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Praise the name of the Lord. We can draw near to God with a pure heart, in truth, clean and clear conscience, being washed by the blood of the Lamb. Draw near unto God. And what did he say? He will draw nigh unto you. He purged our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. He gives us peace and joy in knowing that our sins are forgiven and that our hearts is pure and our heart is clean. And this is why we pray, creating us a clean heart. Hold fast, be strong. Verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. This is our memory verse. Despite the things that are going on around us, we must remember the power of God. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So we can hold fast and we can be strong. We can depend upon God. He is faithful that promise. We must hold fast the profession of our faith. Hold on to your belief. Hold on to the word of God, for he is faithful that promised. Stir up the gift. Make an impact. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. In Daniels 11 and 32 it reads, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries. But... And this is the part that I love down through the years. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Let's stir up. Let's provoke one another to love. Let's provoke one another to love one another and to do good works. Make an impact in the world doing good works. Each and every one of us has a responsibility to make an impact in this world. 
provoke one another to love. We don't want to make the wrong impact. But he says uh, that the people that do know their God, that we shall be strong and that we shall do exploits. Not the assembling of ourselves. In verse 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, nothing new up under the sun but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching this was critical for the people of god during the time of hebrews because of the fear of persecution some of the believers had stopped attending worship services therefore the writer encouraged the believers to pull together to stir up loving and active faith the fellowship of believers is a source of encouragement. We encourage one another when we fellowship and come together. It is an opportunity to share faith and grow stronger. The writer urged the believers to get involved in exhorting, encouraging one another with the truth. Is this not for us today with the fear of COVID and the different interests that people don't seem to have a mind anymore to fellowship and to come out to the house of God. Fear has caused them to stay at home. But listen to what the word of the Lord say. Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But what does he tell us to do? Exhort one another. And also, if we want to do it so much, the more. Why? Because we see the day approaching. If ever a time we need to fellowship and exhort one another, it is in this day and time that we're living in. Our third outline, the priesthood of Christ and the knowledge of truth. Hebrew 10, 26, and 27. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. We don't hear this verse of scriptures being preached too much nowadays. Hebrew warns us against sinful willingly. For willful sin, there is a difference between deliberate rejection of God's word and accidental or occasional mistaken or unknowingly sin. Thank God for the Holy Spirit that reproved the heart of sin and he causes us to repent when we uh, sin. However, when we sin, it's unknowingly or we've made a mistake, there is a difference. And we're going to go right into this even more so. We're going to teach on this right uh, even more so. Sinning willfully. Saints, saints don't sin willfully. We don't plan to sin. We don't practice sin. A front, an action or remark that causes outrage or offense to disrespect, injury, insult, offend. As humans, people stumble, misspeak, or stubbornly refuse to do the right thing. Do we see that in our day and time that we're living in? This, however, must not be the pattern that governs our lives. Saints, we don't mess up. We don't intentionally do these things when we stumble when we misspeak or hopefully none of us will just stubbornly refuse to do the right thing messing up is never what god wants and the holy spirit will convict us and lead us in rectifying our error whether we have been an affront to another person or disobedient to God. So rather we have offended another person, 
the Holy Ghost gives us to rectify our error. When we find ourselves not willing to follow the leading and the guidance and the prompting of the Holy Spirit, we are walking on dangerous territory, and we'll get more into that. We don't want to disrespect. We don't want to injure anyone. We don't want to insult anyone. We don't want to offend anyone. And if by any chance we do these things, we want to rectify our error. We want to confess it. We want to acknowledge it. We want God to help us to repent and get that thing straight. A willful sinner versus if we sin. There is a remedy for our daily sins, or there is a remedy for if we fall into sin. We can, the scripture tell us in 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So saints, we want to be sure that we're not willfully sinning. But if we fall into sin, we can confess our sins and God will cleanse us up from all unrighteousness. Deliberate rejection of Christ after receiving him as Lord and Savior, knowing the knowledge of the truth is a different story. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. My God, that, that sacrificial lamb, Jesus, that lived a holy life and shed his blood on the cross, it's no longer for you when you willfully sin and you have received the knowledge of the truth, but you refuse to change. You just sin willfully. You don't care. Let's find out what happens to that person. Judgment and fiery indignation. That's the anger of God. But a certain fearful looking. This is what, when you willfully sin, this is what you should be looking for. A certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. You're, you are in the a realm of being an adversary to God, and you should look for him to judge you with fearful, fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation. Believers should not willfully rebel against God's provisions after receiving and fully understanding the knowledge of the truth, which is God's, which is Christ's offer of salvation. Hebrew 10, 26. The sin that is freely chosen could not be considered a minor transgression. Let me read that again. The sin that is freely chosen, willfully done, could not be considered a minor transgression, but a deliberate turning away the fact that hebrew 10 27 uses the word adversaries shows that these people are not holding some neutral position they have become the enemies of god do you want to be classified as an enemy of god the bible says he's angry with the wicked every day my god let us oh god let us check our life we don't want to be willfully rebellious and willfully stubborn sinning against god the rejection of the spirit of god historic rejection of god's rule can be found in the way israel turned away from the covenant through unbelief and idolatry and we see that in our Old Testament, how the Israelites fell into sin. They refused to follow God's rule. The people to whom this epistle was written knew how dire it was 
to reject God and his promises. It's a fearful thing, my God, when we reject God, we're stubborn and we're rebellious. And it's and we it's unbelief, you know? In the book of Revelations, <laughs> idolatry and unbelief is listed saying that those that do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. These Jews were Christians, converts who had accepted Jesus Christ as Messiah and Savior. They realized that rejecting Christ meant that they knew what God had done in Christ and yet rejected him. And saints, that's a fearful thing to me. My God, when you know what Christ has done, he's offered you salvation. He's offered you for forgiveness of sin. He paid the price with his life. And we just reject Christ. We willfully turn our backs on him and sin. The rejection of the spirit of God. We're in danger. Fourth outline the priesthood of Christ and how God will judge his people. Hebrew, the 10th chapter, verses 28 through 31. He that despises Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. My God. Those in the, in the Old Testament that despised the law that God had given Moses. It says they died without mercy. Of how much more sore punishment? And this is a question that uh, the writer of the book of Hebrew is asking us. Of how much more, how, of how much sore punishment? Suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. And hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the grace, unto the spirit of grace. My God, my God, how much more punishment shall we be punished when we take God, the, the sacrifice that God has done? When we just take it, in other words, trotting it up under our foot, we reject it. The blood that he shed, we count it as nothing. We count it as an unholy thing. My God. And it done despite unto the spirit of grace. How much sore punishment? What should our punishment be? When he didn't spare those that didn't follow the laws of Moses that Moses has written for the children of Israel. When they didn't follow the law, what you see what happened to them. It says, without mercy, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy. We don't want to fall into the hands of an angry God. The author of our commentary Let's look at the word apostasy, the abandonment or renunciation of a religious or political belief. You have abandoned the, your faith in God. You refuse to obey God. The law of Moses was given by God, and so anyone who rejected it rejected God's direction and was killed without compassion. There was no place for mercy. The offender must be executed. And that's found in Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter and the 6th verse, and the 19th chapter and the 15th verse. If the punishment for rejecting the law of Moses was so severe, the punishment for rejecting Christ is worse because Jesus is greater than Moses. The author of Hebrews invites the audience to work out for themselves what sort of worse punishment someone would deserve for rejecting the gift of God in Christ. What kind of punishment do you think is awaiting for those that reject 
the gift of God, knowing what happened to those that rejected the law of Moses, and Jesus is greater than Moses. Some warnings in our Sunday school lesson today. I'm warning you, verse 30, for we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, said the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. My God, my God, he's warning us through the book of Hebrew that he's going to uh, have the last word. Vengeance belongs to him. And he will recompense, said the Lord. The Lord shall judge his people. We are all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of the way we spent our life down here on earth. And he knows everything. The Lord will act. The Lord will intervene. Saints, we won't get by when we willfully sin and reject Christ. The author's first quotation here is from Deuteronomy 32 and 35, which emphasizes the certainty that the Lord will act. The wrongdoer cannot hope to go unpunished because avenging wrong is in the hands of God. The second quotation is from Deuteronomy 32 and 36. God judges all. Those who turn against Christ must not think they can escape. There is no doubt about the Lord's intervention. He will judge us. All the enemies of God may expect the heaviest judgments of a not, let me see, the heaviest judgments of a not for a time, oh, not for just a time, not for just a period of time, but for eternity. My God, the heaviest judgment for eternity, not just for a time. Saints, we don't want to be found in that predicament. The Lord is the one that is going to judge us. People don't have a uh, place, uh, even uh, anything, a heaven or a hell or anything else to judge us. But God, God will be our judge. People will not judge us. <laughs> they may try to judge us here on earth, but each and every one of us is going to be judged by the almighty God. He's the one that we have to stand before and give an account of the way that we lived our life down here on earth. Here's another, I'm warning you, warning you. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels prove to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Hebrews, the second chapter, verse 1 through 3a. Saints, we won't be able to escape. He's warning us all through the book of Hebrew. Let's pay close attention to these warnings. Let's give heed to the things that we hear. We just shared some of the warnings. I'm warning you. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, places by the blood of Jesus, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us, and he says it three times, and let us, and let us 
For if we go on sinning deliberately, there is no longer remains a sacrifice. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved? Let's be sure to read Hebrew, the 10th chapter, verses 19 through 29. It's a warning. It's another warning. And this ends our Sunday school lesson. My God, we ended with warnings. And so we want to make sure we check our lives and make sure that all of our sins, praise God, is under the blood. We have a holy God that desire to have holy children, and we're to encourage one another to walk up right before him. But if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. It's not whenever we sin. It's not every day we sin. But he said, if, if you just happen to fall into sin, we have an advocate with the brother. With, we have an advocate with Jesus, I'm sorry, and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we confess our sins to him. And this is why we want to live a life that we're always asking God to create in us a clean heart, to help us to walk upright before him, to be holy even as he is holy. Teach us how to be perfected in him daily. Let's support our Sunday school with Cash App, Dollar Sign, Cash New Life, or Givelify at New Life Community Church of God in Christ on Chambers Road. These Sunday school lessons come to help us to make it in, to exhort one another, to encourage one another, to live a prosperous life right down here in this present world. We can live a holy life before God. We can walk up right before him and we can be the living epistles read of men. May God bless each and every one of us.